And we are back. We are talking about hedonic testing or preference testing. And if you haven't watched the first video, I do highly recommend you take some time and watch the first video where we talk about the theory and the structure of some of the different styles of questions that we're asking when we're talking about preference. So much of sensory analysis, as uh, as we've been discussing in this in this channel, is all about finding out what do consumers like and why do they like it? And so hedonic testing is is part of that introduction. And we've walked through some really uh, straightforward methods of doing that. Today, I want to talk about more data analysis and how do you interpret the results? Because it's not as it's not just straightforward. Take a look at the graph and the answers pop out. You've got to really think about each style and the biases and the, the scenarios that are in the analysis itself so that you know that you've got the right analysis and it's leading you the right direction. So I realize this uh, list of learning outcomes is the same as the one before. We're going to focus on these two bottom ones, read the scorecard and interpret the individual result and interpret hedonic scores to be able to make formulation recommendations. But all of these other concepts define the role of hedonic testing in product development processes, define correct hypothesis testing for just about right, Likert and preference and structure questions appropriately for the hypothesis, know what is required for a basic hedonic sensory setup, including the tray setup. We're going to be focusing on that questionnaire scorecard learning outcome here. This is all going to make sense. So we'll read the scorecards and interpret the individual results and interpret hedonic scores to make formulation recommendations. So let's just jump right in here. And again, remember, watch part one before you jump into this one, because we're going to jump straight ahead and assume you've watched part one. So again, just a quick reminder, hedonic or preference testing is all about thinking about how much do people like the food product that you're tasting. And I picked three of my oh. favorite, oh, ding, three of my favorite methods to walk through. I, uh, I take this very pragmatically. There are more advanced methods and we will jump out to a couple other, um, methods that are on the spectrum of preference and uh, descriptive analysis. But uh, these three I find are extremely useful for product developers, and that's why I'm going to spend a lot of time on them. So we're doing rank preference. That's where you're saying, which of these three samples do you prefer? Rank them in your, in your favorite order. The Likert type questionnaire is nice because you could have multiple samples that everyone likes really, really well. And it can help you discern, do you have products that are liked equally? Or conversely, rank preference is notorious that you can rank really bad products, but uh, Likert can help you determine that people maybe generally don't like the product despite the fact that it may rank very highly. Just About Right's really one of my favorites because it's so useful as a product developer because it gives you directionality. It doesn't give you as much about the opinion or the overall opinion, but it gives you a sense of, do I need to increase this attribute or decrease this attribute? Now, just for fun, I have pre-populated a survey tool. So again, today we're talking more about data analysis. And so I want to jump right into a survey tool. And I always crack a joke here that, I'm not going to edit my screen changes out. I happen to program this survey tool into Google uh, Forms. And Google Forms just happens to be a free product for personal use and for um, small scale education use. Uh, uh, Google has a suite of different products and it's nice because the students don't have to set up a fancy account to be able to access. There are a variety of different survey uh, tools that are available online at low cost or at no cost. And I just happen to use Google Forms because it's it does a pretty decent automated job at doing the data analysis. So let's just quickly remind ourselves about the structure of some of these questions. Normally in a full survey tool, I should have some preamble questions saying, Welcome to the survey. This is uh, some general instructions. Here is the risk benefit statement. Here are the allergens and or other uh, food safety issues that you may be concerned about. 
do we have informed consent for you to participate? You should have that. I am jumping straight to the theory behind these questions. So first question was just about right. And you'll notice here we have listed some of those attributes. So we did an attribute analysis on some chocolate chip cookies. We felt these were important attributes for our consumers. And then we determined based off of the based off of these attributes, we've got a just about right scale here. And yes, you could have a seven point or a nine point just about right scale. I stick to five points. It is easier to deal with that um, you're either just about right in this central tendency block here. And that's that's the ideal scenario. We want the panelists to be clicking down that middle line to know that we've got the ideal product. Or is it slightly too little or way too little? Slightly too much or way too much of the different attribute? And so as a product developer, I could look at these attributes and say, okay, if I'm scoring way too much browning, then I either have to think, is there an ingredient in there that's contributing to the browning color of my cookie? Or am I over cooking it and causing too much mailered browning in my cookie during the bake-off process? Maybe we're looking at crispy texture. If it's just about right, that's fantastic. But maybe we've got too little crispy texture. Maybe this is a this is a cookie that has a bit of a chewy or doughy sort of texture. Maybe we need a second attribute to talk about chewiness or doughiness. But um, maybe we've got way too little crispiness. Maybe it's soft and just sort of cardboardy. We'd have to think, do we have enough plasticizer? Do we have enough sugar in there to go through that sort of um, glass transition uh, effect in that cookie to get a crisp snap on that cookie? Same with chocolate chips. That one's pretty straightforward. Way too little? Well, we've just got to increase the amount of chocolate chips while still remaining cost competitive. Or <laughs> I can never have way too much chocolate chips in a cookie. I could. I joked a uh, previous uh, video that I would just eat chocolate chips if I could. Um, buttery flavor, um, if we're formulating with butter, you'd assume it's there. But if you need that as an attribute, but maybe you're formulating with margarine or you're formulating with um, some other solid fat, maybe shortening, you may be needing to add buttery flavor or other natural flavors to that product. Conversely, you may have too much buttery flavor and it's overwhelming other attributes in there. You think from a product development perspective, what do you need to dial up and dial down? In a moment, we'll take a look at the stats analysis on here. That's another just about right. Oh, no, this is not a just about right. This is a liquor. And so same cookie, but now we're thinking about how much do we like each of these attributes? So I've got the same, I've got the same snare, but note down here, I've got a question about overall impression on that product. So how much do I like it? Now we don't want central tendency. We actually want to see right hand tendency in our data. We want to see that people like the browning and it's a very different scenario from just about right. Now we're talking about uh, values and beliefs and not just is the attribute there in the right level. So in this case, now we may be able to hone in. Maybe people, maybe people dislike crispy cookies. Maybe they want chewy cookies. Maybe they dislike chocolate chips. <laughs> Who dislikes chocolate chips? You never know. Honestly, this now hones in on values and values and beliefs. And that's a very different scenario. Now, uh, this is a repeat of the same question, but you'll notice I've introduced a different sample. When we do this together in class, I often just buy some cookies at the grocery store. Maybe I've got some, uh, I don't know, uh, President's Choice decadent chocolate chips versus another store brand. Um, irresistibles or sensations and we'll line those up and, and see how people experience those two different products um, and then last but not least we have this ranked preference and in this case it's a ranked preference of two samples and we can do that data interpretation there so just from a from a structure perspective these are I believe these are radio button multiple choice questions. And so I want to force it so that when I'm answering this, I can own. So this is a multiple choice grid and I'm setting up my rows and I'm setting up my columns. And I believe there's a couple um, radio buttons here where I have to force one response per row. And so 
just a, I always say to people when they're programming online survey tools to make sure and run that survey with your with your team before you release it to the public and try and break it. Have your have your like teenage kid try and do the survey tool and see if they can muck it up because that that level of user interface and making sure that um, your survey is not going to cause misleading answers. Make sure that you you test it and you 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 try and break it and you try and abuse it before you release your survey to the public because you don't want people not finishing the survey or uh, stepping aside from your sensory analysis because they can't use the tool. And I've seen it before where um, folks will have a question in their survey and the sur the question is broken and then they don't get good data. Now, I imagined uh, this data set. I Actually, I think I, I used it in a class at one point in time. And the nice thing about Google, Google Forms is that it actually does some basic data analysis for us. Now, I'll show you the data um, and you can export it out to an Excel uh, folder, or in this case, it's going to ex it's going to export it to Google Sheets. But you can then export that to Excel for data analysis. The challenge is that it's going to give you words. It's not going to give you numbers. It's going to give you words, and you have to do some extra manipulation. But you'll note here we've got a basic sort of histogram presentation of the different data sets. And so what we're looking at, it's a histogram or frequency table. And based off of these different colors, what we want to see is on each of these attributes on sample 172, we want to see ideally that yellow just about right honing in. And so in this case, we know on cookie 172, we don't have enough browning. We need to be increasing it whether that's through cook-off or inclusion of more browning ingredients, maybe some brown sugar or some molasses or um, more spices to increase that browning color. In the case of crispy texture, we are, we're getting closer, but we still have too little. Is there a sweet spot in terms of having that maximal just about right? Ideally, it would be approximately 70% of the respondents, but every organization is going to have a different threshold of what they deem is just about right. And it also is going to be better if we have more respondents. And in this case, I think I only had seven respondents on this on this uh, survey tool when I released it. Um, so on any of these, do we have a sense of just about right? We're getting closer on the buttery flavor, but still we could be dialing up that butteriness. Do we have anything that's way too much? Interesting, the vanilla, we've got a bit of skewness here. Do you see how it's distributed where uh, we've got a few people on the way too much and a few people on the way too little and not, what we don't want to see is a lot of flat lining on this. We want to see, we want to see that central tendency. Now let's scroll down to our, our Likert results. This is our Likert and what we want to see is lots of purple in this case. Do we see any purple here? What we don't want to see is blue and red. We want to see green and purple. And rest assured, I think this cookie needs some re reformulation because I don't see any purple on this cookie at all, which is really, really interesting. Let's scroll down to cookie 914 here. And so in cookie 914, we've got way better just about right scores. And we've got so more central tendency of that yellowness. Um, and so in the, uh, the nice thing about Google Forms is that it does give you some data analysis. It doesn't give you a lot of disaggregated numbers. And so some of these numbers you could capture manually and then do additional analysis. But from a really um, introductory product development perspective, you can grab really in, uh, interesting information with minimum analysis involved. So I think in terms of cookie, 914 is scoring better in terms of just about right on these attributes. Brown sugar, perhaps a little less brown sugar, substitute more white sugar. Um, vanilla is pretty good, maybe dial it down a fraction of a percent. Buttery flavor is slightly too much, so do we substitute in shortening or do we use a butter that has less of a, of a buttery note to it? I know that sounds weird. Chocolate chips, looks like we're doing pretty good there. Each of these attributes, we are able to hone in and dial up or dial down or give a, uh, an approval 
so that we can move our product forward in the product development process. Taking a look at our Likert score here, we've got, again, what are we looking for? We're looking for mostly green and purple in terms of positive opinion here. Green and purple are on that like slightly or like extremely. And oftentimes you'll express it as a percent of the total score. So you'd say we've got four plus two, we have six out of seven respondents or whatever the fraction is, six out of seven respondents said they either liked slightly or liked extremely the brown color. Three plus three, six out of seven respondents said they either liked slightly or liked extremely the crispy texture. And conversely, you could say one out of seven respondents disliked the crispy texture. Seven respondents is a pretty small number, and so I wouldn't have a huge amount of confidence in it, but that's not unrealistic for you to have within a small R&D team that sort of response. So it looks like 914 is the better cookie. And let's roll down and see, is 914 the better cookie? Indeed, from a rank preference perspective, 914 is the preferred cookie by 85.7% of our population, or six out of seven respondents. So from a data analysis perspective, I realize that it's very hands-off. However, there's, in some respects, the fact that you don't have to go and do an additional few hours of data manipulation can really be useful from a rapid prototyping and a rapid product development perspective. I've seen teams in R&D centers build out a basic survey tool of this sort, and they can reconfigure it quite easily and then hand it out and, and send out by email to their team a link saying, please fill this out. We're going to taste some product in this morning's scrum. And we want to get your feedback. We'll be having our team meeting at 10 o'clock. Please, please uh, bring your telephone. We'll fill out the survey. The respondents then fill out that survey and the responses are ready to go in, in that summary format. Now we can export the data and I will have a second video when I'm doing uh, CATA or check all that apply that talks about how do we do frequency when we've got word type responses. And it's a bit more of an advanced topic that we have to use um, some macros. And the macros are, are not difficult to find, but we have to plug in some macros into Excel to be able to do frequency tables on words. So don't be afraid of the data analysis, though do take the time and make sure that the data that you are seeing absolutely makes sense. So just about right, central tendency. Likert, we're looking at tendency towards like slightly or like extremely. And in rank preference, just remember, if I've got two lousy products and I've got a rank preference, I will be able to see that my product is lousy in my Likert, but a rank preference alone would give a false sense of which product is better. And so always make sure that you're linking your survey results in a sort of concerted um, harmonious system so that you can get the big picture on your product in a successful way. All right, I think that's enough for this data analysis. I will have some more videos coming up shortly and I always love to hear your questions. I've got some Q and A um, videos that I wanna be making in the, in the near term. So love to hear from you and take care. We'll talk to you soon.